Hello, everyone. Uh, it is 18.30, so we're just about ready to get started. Uh, Saul one. Uh, just a reminder to everybody to silence or turn off your cell phones. If any of you have questions during the talk, we have the microphones. Uh, just queue up at the microphones and uh, speak and ask your questions into the microphone so that they can be recorded. Uh, we have Manuel Atog here uh, giving a presentation entitled Security in the Cardholder Data Processing. Uh, he does security audits for credit card processing uh, companies and he is going to, uh, I'll turn it over to him so he can tell you all about it. Thank you. So again, hello, my name is Manuel Atuk. I'm, uh, my voice is gone, so sorry if uh, this sounds a little bit nasty. I'm going to speak about security in the cardholder data processing. I'm, uh, as uh, he said, an auditor for the cardholder data environment. So I'm auditing for this PCI Security Standards Council, formerly MasterCard and Visa, but that uh, I, I will introduce that uh, now. So the agenda is only three topics. First of all, the company I'm working for, SRC and PCI, so a little bit understanding uh, what we are doing, how much we are doing, so you get a, um, a clue about uh, the statistical factors, how, how many audits we did and all that stuff. The motivation of PCI and what is PCI, PCI stands for the payment card industry, that's the short for uh, payment card industry data security standard. That's a standard I'm, I'm auditing for, but uh, if you see PCI, I mean the payment card industry data security standard. Um, after this motivation and, and uh, what it is to inter introduce uh, the um, standard, I'm going into the experiences and the lessons learned uh, when we conducted uh, security scans and security audits uh, within the standard. And... Um, there were some very interesting experiences. I will come to that later. So uh, PCI, or uh, before PCI, SRC was uh, the first company worldwide which was accredited in uh, the MasterCard and STP, uh, MasterCard, STP and Visa IS uh, programs. That's uh, so both programs uh, which have been introduced by the payment schemes. Later it was uh, changed into the payment card industry. And we, are cooperation, we have cooperations with uh, different um, acquirers. You can see them. Uh, some of them are really international. Um, one is even in Israel located. We have uh, more than 3,000 merchants which we provide uh, the, the uh, office uh, the service for, and uh, around about 35 service providers um, in, in various countries where we do these audits and uh, security scans for. That uh, was the first part. The second part, <laughs> not every part is that uh, small. Um, the motivation of and what is uh, PCI? I don't know if someone knows this guy. This guy uh, said in 1911, he was a captain, said he had uh, no problems in the last 40 years when he was uh, at sea. And um, he said, you know, 40 years without problems and uh, I know there will never happen something. One year later, the Titanic sunk and the captain was Mr. Smith. So the thing what I want to tell you with this is when you had no problems in the past, you have no clue what will happen in the future. The risk is uh, therefore underestimated, not only for being compromised, in general, risk is underestimated. As people think uh, so many years nothing happened, is this is a, a point uh, for nothing will happen in the future. So this is really a problem. I have some examples to give you an idea of uh, what can happen if you don't implement such standards correctly or protect the information correct. This is one sample. Credit cards have been compromised at the University of California, Los Angeles. It's uh, from December 
um, maybe for this lecture. <laughs> Approximately 800,000 individuals um, that their names and certain personal information, including credit card data, not of all 800,000 uh, students and uh, employees, but uh, quite a few of them have been compromised. So this is not only a small thing, it's a, it's a big thing. Um, 19,000 credit cards have been compromised at AT&T, for example, and uh, they informed the fewer than 90,000 customers uh, about this problem, but in fact there again were a lot of credit cards uh, stolen. This is really interesting, 14,000 credit cards compromised at the Department of Defense. Um, I was researching just for some samples and uh, when I saw this one I really didn't know what to tell you about. I mean, everything is said. <clears throat> Again, one sample, uh, interesting one. Guidance Software is a developer of the forensic software NCase. Uh, it's exactly a forensic tool with which you will target such an incident. Interesting is that uh, this company itself had a serious problem and 3,800 credit cards have been compromised in their cardholder environment. The consequences from such an incident, um, I have a small sample only. Uh, we have seen the big numbers, now I will show you a um, small merchant who is only transactioning and processing 250 to 300 uh, transactions per month. And uh, just a uh, sample, he's storing this uh, few transactions for the last three years. So we are talking about a potential compromise of 10,000 cards. If these 10,000 cards would be compromised completely, like a SQL injection and uh, someone steals all the data out of it, the costs uh, are dramatic. Uh, the, the thing is, incident fee, 50,000 euro, is uh, acceptable. Issue a recovering fee, you have to reissue the um, stolen cards and uh, fraudulent misused cards. It's uh, again 50,000, but the main uh, factor is the fraud. Fraud uh, for these 10,000 cards will uh, raise up to 20, 000, uh, 20 million uh, euro because a uh, fraudulent uh, used card is around about 2,000 euro. It's, it's two to 3,000 dollar, depend on uh, what, what is uh, the, the value of, of uh, the card. But in, in fact, this is a big, a big thing. What I didn't uh, uh, calculate is the cost for the litigation and even uh, the reputation is not uh, um, in, in this uh, summary. But you can see this was only this uh, small merchant and uh, the big things we have seen before, the samples, are much more bigger. So this is really a problem for um, card schemes and uh, of course everyone who is involved in the cardholder data processing. The answer to these problems was released from MasterCard uh, in 2002 and Visa in 2001. They had introduced two programs, the site data protection and the account information security programs. Um, they are split into four uh, things, three are the auditing parts and one is the definition of some things uh, like um, levels, um, deadlines, penalties. The incident fee, for example, 50,000 euro is defined in, in uh, these programs and the self-assessment questionnaire, the security scan and aud security audit have been defined uh, to be uh, conducted from uh, accredited um, companies who know how to uh, check with, with this uh, standard for the compliance and uh, check in which level, for example, a, a merchant or service provider is classified and if the deadlines are correct and all that. Um, later they joined forces, so uh, since September 2006, um, not only MasterCard and Visa, but uh, some, some major other card schemes uh, founded the uh, PCI Security Standards Council and uh, wanted to um, develop and maintain the standard together. So this was an agreement between the card schemes. And uh, the current actual version, it's 1.1, uh, it's released in September 2006 when they joined the forces, um, is split into 12 uh, main requirements. It's structured into six areas. 
and it's relevant for every member, merchant, and service provider that is storing, processing, or transmitting cardholder data. This includes, for example, someone who is doing only the data storage for another company. So if, if he's storing cardholder data for another company, he's classified as some service provider who's storing cardholder data. So he has to so store that in, in a compliant way to these uh, requirements. The cr requirements uh, are, uh, as I said, uh, structured in, in 12 requirements just to go quickly through them to get a clue for what, what the standards uh, stands for. Requirement one is uh, install and maintain a firewall configuration to protect data. It should be uh, common sense, but in fact it's not. So it's uh, uh, put into the requirements. The second one is do not use vendor supply defaults for system passwords and other security parameters. That is also something that should be uh, quite clear, but uh, some of the uh, worms, like the SQL Slammer, um, did show us uh, that some vendor supply defaults are not changed. So this is addressed in this requirement. The main requirement is requirement three, protect stored data. You have to store the data um, encrypted, or you have to mask or um, um, corrupt it so no one can, can uh, get the full track. Um, the fourth requirement is encryption uh, for the transmission of cardholder data and sensitive information, which is uh, the expiration date, for example, across public networks. So if, if you um, transmit this data, you have to encrypt uh, this data line. Um, this is addressed in this requirement. The next one is uh, use and regularly update antivirus software. It's again one, one uh, thing to address uh, Trojan, uh, malware, uh, worms, whatever. Um, next one is develop and maintain secure systems and applications. So you should have a patch management, uh, change management, and uh, check patches before you install them. Maybe something is uh, crashing or uh, a patch is not 100% uh, correctly. So this is addressed here. The next ones are uh, requirement seven, restrict access to data by business need to know. This is really important because uh, normally you give a lot of people access to data to sensitive and uh, we have seen one of the card numbers has a value of 2,000 euro. Uh, you, you give too many people's access to it even if they don't need it for the business uh, process. So this, this is addressed here to, to Critically, uh, critically ask for is it really need for the, for the business, for the business process or whatever, and uh, if not, uh, just uh, restrict this access. If access is uh, needed by business need to know, uh, requirement eight uh, comes uh, in, into mind. It's uh, to assign a unique ID to each person with computer access, which can access uh, full card numbers. So. You can track back uh, to an individual who was uh, connecting to this data or, or viewing this data or maybe even uh, which account was compromised and uh, with this one data was uh, stolen. It's interesting for the reconstruction of, of the incident. Requirement nine is the restrict um, physical access to cardholder data. So this is mainly what is done on site at the data center, you check if uh, the rack is uh, secure, if the data center is secure, that no one can gain access without uh, viewing that he has a business need and all this stuff. Requirement 10 is uh, track and monitor all access to network resources and cardholder data. So you should have audit trails for every access. You, you should reconstruct in, in case of a compromise what happened. A uh, lot of log files are uh, not present if you need them, so this is uh, addressed here. Um, requirement 11 is regularly test security systems and processes, so you should do some penetration tests, um, security scans of your systems to check and to ask if everything what you did implement is still uh, functional and working or if there are, again, security holes and gaps. And uh, here is also addressed the security scans uh, that uh, accredited auditors have to do. Requirement 12 is uh, the 
information security policy to address information security. This is mainly addressing uh, the management. Uh, the management should um, give a statement out uh, to say yes, information is a uh, value for this company and we should protect it and uh, therefore the management should get an approval to give resources uh, to protect cardholder data. So this is addressed here. You must of course have policies to define who could access what and why. Links where you can, uh, for example, download the standard, some add-ons and um, additional glossary and all that stuff is uh, PCI Security Standards Org, which is a new website of uh, the joint forces. Um, the Visa EU AIS program website is uh, located as visaeurope.com. Uh, Visa USA has a CISP program, which is um, very, very similar to AIS, but Visa is uh, located or uh, split it into six different regions, and uh, USA called it CISP, Cardholder Information Security Program, and uh, Visa EU decided to call it AIS. It's maybe for marketing purpose, I don't know, but uh, I did put the link for the USA um, also into it because there are some additional interesting information on, on, on there. Uh, MasterCard has a known uh, SDP program website, and you can check them. It's, it's interesting stuff there. So we switch now to the interesting part, hopefully. Um, experiences and lessons learned when we conducted the security scans and security audits. I will uh, first uh, give you some general information. The requirement three, three to uh, protect uh, stored data is addressing um, things like CVV2, CVC2, which is a three or four digit number which is printed on the backside of a credit card. On Amex, it's on the front. It's not allowed at all, never ever to store it after the authorization. You need it, of course, for the authorization, but if you get uh, the true or false or error code back, you're not allowed to store it anymore. Um, but it's done very often. So uh, merchants and service providers uh, don't even know that this is forbidden. And it's not only forbidden since these programs have been introduced, it was forbidden when this CVV2, CVC2 was introduced. So. When, when they added this security feature into, into uh, their uh, cards, it, it was from the beginning, it was totally forbidden to store them. But uh, in, in these audits, we did find a lot, so not everyone understood this. Um, same goes to the magnetic stripe data, the, the track data, which is on this magnetic stripe. It's not allowed. Uh, at all to, to store a full track because if you have a copy of the full track you can easily make a copy of the card because uh, it's, it's no challenge to, to put the full max stripe into new card so again this is not allowed at all but we found some sometimes and um, in, in general also systems are really poorly managed and maintained um, two thirds of uh, Everyone who we scanned first time um, had significant vulnerabilities, which means we had access to sensitive, we could have access uh, to sensitive data or even uh, could uh, compromise and own the system. Uh, the thing is uh, why I uh, say could have is the standards clearly define that we don't compromise the system. It's a, it's a scan uh, which you have to do by uh, fingerprinting technologies and all that to uh, check out which kind of patches are installed or not. If you're not sure, you have to put them into the report and classify it. Um, but in, in fact, a lot of people have really serious problems uh, with this at the first scan. Um, when they finish the scan and they get the report where it's written what serious problems they have and what minor problems they have, they could fix them or not. It's uh, sometimes only informational uh, um, things. It's not every time a problem. But um, they, the, the way is they get the report, they can uh, check what is the problem, how can they fix it, and uh, after that they must uh, pass a clean rescan. And uh, one third uh, fails even to pass the second scan 
because they didn't uh, patch or, or update or harden uh, the system in a correct way. So uh, this is really interesting because uh, even, even still after they know exactly what is the problem and how they can address it, um, they are even not uh, able to, to fix this uh, really secure. And these numbers are irrespective of the number of transactions which uh, this merchant or service provider is, is um, processing or even the size of organization. So this goes cross through uh, two, three people, employees, uh, uh, companies like uh, up to 500, 600, 1,000, 1,500 people, um, companies. So this is an um, interesting number. The interesting things we found in security scans have been an X display manager control protocol, which was up and running. Uh, I mean, <laughs> remote management is done a little bit different, <laughs> but um, in fact, we found it. Running ILK server in the payment processing environment was uh, also very interesting because I have heard of uh, e-commerce transactions, but um, IRC transactions. I don't know. <laughs> Even the next one, uh, BitTorrent, Emule, and eDonkey, um, peer-to-peer e-commerce card transactions. I don't know. Uh, but in fact, this this was uh, found in in the cardholder processing environment. I mean, if uh, some administrators or whoever want to have some some peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, they should put a separate uh, DMZ on and uh, put this machine into it but uh, they, they put it on uh, productive machines where cardholder data is processed, so this is uh, really interesting. Um, SSL version 2 uh, protocol was uh, very often active. Uh, so the thing is that in the configurations, this is a little bit tricky, I guess, for, for you, I think it's, it's very clear, but for people who see this string of configuration to fix it, uh, it it's maybe too much. So uh, normally only SSL version 3 and TLS version 1 is allowed, but uh, the default of uh, Internet Information Server and, for example, Apache is uh, SSL version 2 is active, and guess what? It's not hardened. Same goes to SSL uh, encryption. They have, of course, 128-bit uh, encryption active, but the thing is, all other defaults also. So you can force the server to go down to, I don't know, 56-bit uh, uh, DS encryption, and the server is doing it because it supports this weak encryption, and uh, this fallback option, of course, should be uh, not allowed, but uh, we very often found this. This is maybe interesting for the Feno Elite guys. A uh, lot of <laughs> management interfaces accessible on uh, Cisco devices. I don't know if you have to manage them uh, from the whole uh, internet, but maybe they can limit it to some special IPs or a VPN. But we found them a lot. So, Also, at the web servers, uh, cross-site scripting is really up to date. A lot of people implement it, but it's not allowed. <laughs> So um, maybe they should uh, do some uh, stricter development to uh, enforce that cross-site scripting is not possible. But again, we found a lot on, on uh, web servers. Um, even uh, also the, the ses session fixation and uh, session hijacking was very often possible um, because the implementation was not so good. Um, Web servers used also plain text form-based authentication. Um, if you put in your credit card data, this is not uh, the best way to protect the data. So, Same goes to uh, mail servers, which are in this cardholder processing environment again. They also accept plain text credentials, and you can, of course, uh, with that hijack uh, system and switch to the next one. Coming to the audits. Um, we found some interesting things in the key management. Um, key management is normally um, a good, a very well documented process, uh, but maybe it's too complex for, for a lot of people to understand uh, what a split key and a 4i principle is. Uh, what we have seen in, in, in implementation was uh, not to 
generate a key, split it into two parts, two key custodians are um, with the four eyes principle responsible for each part to uh, have two people um, handling the key. Uh, they made it the way that they encrypt the data with the key of one guy and the encrypted data is again encrypted with the key of another guy. Um, that's no split key technique because the first guy, of course, can make a copy or a dump of the data and then encrypt it. That uh, was not really a four eyes principle. But uh, this was one uh, try to implement it. Uh, we changed that process later. Um, also interesting was a uh, company, they had this split key and four eyes principle in the processing environment were very well uh, implemented. And when uh, we asked uh, how the key is generated and uh, stored, um, they explained that uh, the database administrator is generating the key, splitting it, putting it into the database, and uh, then it's protected by two different people who are responsible for each part. Um, I mean, he could make a copy, but they didn't realize it. Uh, after I mentioned it, they immediately changed this process, but that was an interesting implementation too. One thing we found in, an, in a very big company, they had an, an own developed or a, a software vendor developed an, an uh, application for them to process the transactions and uh, to work with them. And they had in, in the um, chargeback handling module, they had implemented a patch to mask the primary count number um, for eight months. So it was uh, when, when we addressed this uh, problem, they said, no, it's already addressed before eight months. We have uh, changed it into uh, the, the maximum we can uh, show. It's uh, shown there. You can uh, show the first six digits and the last four as a maximum. And this is no protect worth primary count number because you cannot reconstruct the full number of the first six and the last four. Um, and they said, yes, we have already masked uh, the data in, in a compliant way. And when we went through uh, the websites and, and the chargeback handling module uh, on site, uh, we saw the full number. Um, we were asking, is uh, this correct or what about the patch? And they said, mm, maybe it's the test account, we should check another one. And again, the full number was shown. They uh, didn't really know what to say and started to phone to the uh, software vendor. And um, finally, uh, it came out. They uh, released this patch, it was implemented, everything uh, was fine. But uh, later, they released a new patch, and uh, this was installed, and it reverted the old patch. So they forgot to implement it into the new patch. <laughs> Very interesting. And no one checked it. So uh, this was, of course, not uh, very good. I think the next 100 patches are for free. Um, what also is really interesting, um, the thing that you have, uh, the, the standard requires everyone to have a unique user ID. A unique user ID, if, of course, uh, uh, is uh, individual and can be tracked to an individual, so shared accounts are not uh, allowed. Uh, on Windows systems, you can uh, put an, uh, one or two people into the administrator's group, deactivate the administrator's account and the guest account. On uh, Linux systems, you can use uh, SU or sudo and uh, deactivate the root account. But very often when I take a sample of uh, routers, switches, manageable or whatever, you see only one single account. And uh, the question is, what about the substitute administrator? I mean, if you have only one account and this guy breaks his leg and uh, gets into the hospital, what about uh, the second guy? So this, this is a clue for a shared account. And uh, you can find that really... Uh, very often on these uh, network devices or appliances, they only put one account into it and uh, everyone or every administrator is using it. That's, of course, not the, not the goal of uh, tracking it back to an individual. Same goes to the wrong in implementation to uh, deleting data. Deleting data secure is wiping it. Uh, the standard defines some military wiping. It's classified like you put uh, seven times zeros and uh, ones over it, and uh, finally two times random. 
I guess, and um, instead they only delete the data. So they generate batch files with tons of uh, credit cards in, uh, sending it over via secure copy or whatever, and finally delete the file. So an attacker could easily, if he gains access to the system, reconstruct the file in, in uh, some seconds, minutes, and uh, make a copy of it. So this is no... Uh, secure deletion, but we find it very often. And um, even on, on, in uh, commercial software you can buy to process uh, cardholder data. This, this is really often not implemented. Uh, software is generating temporary files uh, which are uh, finally deleted, but contain, of course, again, the full numbers. Um, so even the software vendors have to understand this to, to securely delete every single file which was generated, even if it's temporarily generated. But I think there is a lot of work to explain that to all the developers. Um, this thing was really interesting because it impressed me. A company with 600 employees, and of course they have visitors in the meeting rooms, they have public accessible JAKs, you can by DHCP get an IP address, and um, there is no segmentation. One single company-wide intranet for the 600 employees and all the visitors, and everyone can potentially access all servers, hosts, and mainframes. Uh, that's a really interesting trust relationship. The other trust relationship, which is really interesting, is the uh, development and the productive environment. Some people think they can uh, spare some money when they put everything into one machine or one system. Um, this is done for different reasons. Uh, some systems, uh, they say, is, are expensive, or uh, operating system licenses are expensive, or it's uh, too much work to have a development and uh, production, production system. So they put everything on one machine, they can develop on it and uh, easily make the release, and the release is processing the data. Too many people have access to the system, and of course, uh, development some, sometimes needs some special uh, access and uh, then it's not minimized for business need and uh, this is a potential risk. So this is what we find very often. That's uh, not really good implementation of development. Um, another interesting thing was that a physical audit trail uh, at, a, at a big data center uh, was existent, so you had a book, you have to sign in, you write your name, company, time uh, when you got in, time when you get out. And during the audit, uh, they represented the uh, physical audit trail and said, this is the audit trail for the last year, and I opened it and saw it is empty. <laughs> uh, I would have been the first one to write into it that I'm accessing the data center. I was wondering, uh, I think, I mean, they have, they have two perfect situations here. Ideal remote administration, never, anyone must uh, go to the systems and reboot them or whatever, and they seem to have no hardware problems in this big data center. That was really interesting, and when I started to ask, they said, yes, you know, sometimes uh, we forget it, and um. so, of course, uh, an audit trail has only a value if it's really uh, complete, if you have a audit trail, which is not really complete, you um, check for wrong things, and uh, this was an interesting thing. Um, another uh, small way of implementation of, of some backups was uh, at, at one big uh, customer. He located his backup tapes at a third party, the CEOs are uh, good friends, and when I said, okay, it's no problem, because uh, this is for uh, catastrophic uh, um, problems, very good to have backup tapes uh, not on-site, it's off-site, some kilometers away. What about the contract or policy to access uh, the backup tapes, store them in a secure safe, whatever? He said, yes, we are friends, and, you know, uh, we don't need that. Uh, I mean, uh, everyone could make a copy of it or throw it into the trash, and someone can pick it up. Um, if, if you uh, Google a little bit for backup tapes and, and uh, credit card problems, uh, you will easily see some, some serious problems from some banks or other companies. They send uh, data uh, backup tapes to, to some uh, 
um, data storage entities to uh, via, via UPS or whatever. It's not uh, secured or protocoled or audit trailed, and uh, the backup tapes uh, get lost or uh, some more pop up somewhere else. It's uh, not the way it should go, so you should have a contract and a policy which clearly defines where to store it and how to, uh, how to move it to the site. And here it was not done that way. No system hardening in general was uh, interesting. At one database or at, at one database cluster, uh, they had the complete compiler collection installed. So it's a nice service for some attackers. I mean, what does a compiler collection do on a database system? So uh, it, what, it was not really hardened. Same goes to uh, the different uh, editors. Uh, I mean, if you represent an attacker or the editors, he can uh, check which one is his favorite. Uh, me, for example, I hate VI and Vim, so uh, for me it was, would, would be nice if I text the system to have some different editors to get uh, quicker to the interesting parts. On productive systems, we have seen uh, also at, at the audit, the scan was okay and everything was uh, secure from outside because the firewall uh, didn't uh, let us give a clue for the ENAT day, but in fact it was running on the system. And uh, when I asked for what is the ENAT day on, on this productive system, they said, hmm, good question. And they checked out and saw Yes, the software was uh, formally installed for a test, but we forgot to deinstall it, but we shut down the server. The problem is it was a Debian system, and if you have an upgrade of the software, it restarts the server. So it was running because they didn't uh, harden the system and put this uh, in a day out of, out of the uh, software packages. Same goes to different software like uh, WGET. Uh, I mean, this is, uh, you can, put uh, data securely by SCP or uh, whatever to the system. You don't need uh, such weak tools, which are only uh, a good uh, service to attackers so they have a complete environment to work on. Um, so you should harden your systems, but what we see is uh, very often that they are not hardened. The systems that we see, or the operating systems that we see, are really different. Um, they use everything from BST to Linux to Gentoo to, to uh, Microsoft uh, flavor. Everything is, is uh, possible. Um, even only Microsoft, uh, uh, completely Microsoft-based environments and completely Linux-based environments, we have seen everything. Uh, but uh, sometimes we also see some very old Red Hat 6.2, Red Hat 6.0, Zuse, I don't know, 7.2 and, and Windows NT and uh, some very old Debian stable um, distributions which, which were still on the productive system up and running, but uh, in fact these are no more maintained and you don't get security patches uh, for these machines and they are still processing cardholder data. So um, when you start asking for the patch management, uh, we switch to the next one. We have two options of answers. The first one uh, is uh, the we will. Uh, oh, it's wrong. We will do that uh, soon. And uh, the other one is uh, we never change a running system. Um, for for some systems, I, I can understand that. Uh, f for example, Sun. If if you uh, if you get an, an Sun AIX. Uh, um, if, if you want to install a patch on it, you have to uh, shut it down to a single uh, user uh, mode without uh, internet connection and all that stuff. So 24-7 uh, up and running system uh, is uh, in, in maintenance mode and you can't uh, do your processing. So this is really uh, a lose of, of money and that's not really a good way. But the unmaintained uh, uh, distributions I mean, that's uh, definitively not discussable. They should upgrade, of course, the systems. But in fact, it's not done every time. Full primary account number in log files. Um, you know, it, it is uh, required to have a lot of uh, audit trails and log files, but uh, 
what we found out sometimes when we check uh, the existing log files on site is that they forgot to filter the full pan in the log files. So they have an encrypted database with uh, AIS 256-bit uh, uh, strong encryption. And uh, next to this machine, uh, the web server is based and it receives the e-commerce transactions uh, uh, from the web server and it's storing the full uh, pan in, in the uh, web server log file. So here it's protected and here you have uh, simply forgotten to filter them out. Another one uh, did his job, but not 100% uh, correct, because he filtered the GET requests, but some of his merchants uh, used POST requests. He didn't know that because he said, our service is a GET request. Uh, when we found this out, he was wondering why POST requests are existent. He checked this with the merchants and found out that they are using it because they implemented it that way. They didn't know that it's only limited to GET requests. So uh, you should, of course, uh, clearly define what uh, you're using. And if you implement the filter, you should, of course, uh, check if it's uh, really working. So we had a lot of uh, um, card data in, in these uh, this log files because they are, of course, uh, stored for a minimum of more than one year. And in one year, you can have a lot of uh, card data in, in the log files. The CVV2 and CVC2 uh, within the database. It's uh, interesting how, how uh, many people are still storing them or uh, forget to change uh, um, the process, or even if, the, if when they implement uh, a change of the process, so they are not storing the three or four uh, digits. Instead, they are only storing a received, not received, uh, or a failure code. And um, they switch to this process, they simply forget to uh, delete the formally stored CVV data or CV, CVC2 data. And uh, when we uh, make this where statement, uh, a lot of uh, CVV data is, is a result and they are always wondering and when they reconstruct what happened, it's always they switched the process but forgot to delete the old data. And, uh, at one customer, it was around about 500,000 of this strictly forbidden cardholder data on the database. So that would be a serious problem uh, if, if an attacker would gain access to it. Same goes to full track two data. It's again the track data on the magnetic stripe at the backside. Um, this is uh, sometimes stored when the transaction processing was interrupted. So you had a problem and uh, you uh, program the machines that way that if it has a problem, make a core dump of this data and uh, I will debug that and uh, reduce the chargeback because this is, uh, of course, expensive. Um, this is, of course, again, forbidden because you store the full track if you do that. And uh, by the way, this was a problem uh, which uh, killed card systems in the USA. I don't know if you remember it, before one or two years, it was mentioned by Fefe at, at one of the uh, talks. Um, card systems had a problem with potentially for 40 million uh, cards which were compromised. In fact, after the investigation, they found out 214,000 tracks have been uh, fraudulent misused, and uh, the company doesn't exist anymore. In Google Cache, but no more. Um, Um, the firewall rule set, yes, uh, very interesting is a uh, lot of people are still not using a deny all rule. I mean, uh, that's really no challenge and it should be common sense. But uh, if you check all the rules and you're asking for what about the first and the interesting and the, uh, we have a checklist uh, to, to make a mark on that, tell us uh, where is the deny all rule. And uh, sometimes you get this, uh, hmm? And uh, you simply see, okay, they never uh, read a good book about firewall policies, uh, but um, <laughs> same goes to historic firewall rules. Uh, they implement them, change the environment, put some new systems online, old systems uh, are um, put into another DMZ or no, no more processing cardholder data. But in fact, the firewall rules are not updated, so they are not even regularly reviewed to see here is still a historic uh, rule and uh, it should be deleted now. And uh, these historic rules are sometimes a problem that uh, 
peer-to-peer -peer or whatever uh, pops up and uses this open line. Um, yeah, real cardholder data is normally forbidden to use in, in development systems. So uh, you have official test data to, to uh, do some tests and quality assurance because of, co of course you must uh, test and, and make some QA um, when you release uh, a new version of your software which is processing the data. But uh, we found out that a lot of people are doing a database dump and implement it on the, um, on the development system to do a final check with the real data. And the development system is not patched since, I don't know, the last decade. <laughs> and, uh, but, but the productive system is like Fort Knox. So they should maybe also implement that on the second system or not use the real data. Uh, sometimes they don't understand that uh, correct. Also, the testing of new patches happens sometimes with real cardholder data from an employee. So uh, when, when I interviewed uh, the administrator and said, OK, how about the testing? Uh, how, how do you process that? He said, yes, when we have a new release, we uh, put that on one machine, and uh, one of our employees is doing a transaction with his card, and uh, we see it's working. And uh, we've bought some minor things, and we uh, put this machine then online. Of course, this is not uh, really allowed, and uh, I guess not every employee is really happy with this situation, but they're using it that way, and uh, of course, it's not a good way. The thing with which I had really, personally, really problems because I didn't ever believe that such things would happen was when we were talking to prepare an audit at a, at a big company. Um, we went to this requirement nine, physical security, and they said, yes, we can make an uh, check on, on the complete requirement. We have a very high security data center. It's, uh, it has every single feature with uh, every single, I don't know who, they had uh, biometrics, they had uh, tokens, they had, uh, I don't know, a lot of equipment and uh, we found out, okay, this uh, would be really no challenge for, for the requirement nine and we can uh, check that and switch to the next uh, maybe problems on the next requirements. And when we went to the chargeback processing, uh, chargeback is when you give a, give a transaction back, um, they said, yes, if, if we have a problem with a merchant who has uh, chargebacks, we uh, put this chargeback, uh, we, we do some research on this chargeback at a system with uh, Microsoft Access. And I was wondering, like a high secure data center and a system with Microsoft Access where they do chargeback handling, uh, more details please. And they said, yes, you know, uh, one of the employees' uh, workstation uh, has uh, Microsoft Access. He puts the data from the last year in because chargeback could be in the last uh, 180 uh, days and uh, it will be um, uh, announced latest 180 days later. So we have one year of history in this Access database and he is doing some investigation to find out if it's uh, okay or not. And uh, as it was a really big company, they have uh, many million transactions a year. And an employee's workstation was Microsoft Access, no encryption, no uh, whatever protection on the data, but a high secure data center for many million euros. Um, I mean, it's a little bit uh, not balanced. So I said, why did you spend all that money into the high secure data center? I mean, if I would be the attacker, I would only take this uh, workstation or even only the hard disk and go out and uh, you made my day. But uh, they, I, I guess they didn't really understand uh, the, the problem and the situation here because they said, oh, really, no, uh, hmm. normally we protect the data in the data center and there no one could access it and then it's secure. So uh, that was a really interesting situation because I really didn't understand what they wanted to do with this access. Uh, I mean, it's not even a database. It's something from Microsoft. Um, 
Also interesting is many companies have no cross-cut shredders. They have maybe a shredder for 20 euros somewhere, which makes some big stripes, so you can easily reconstruct uh, what was uh, striped. Um, a cross-cut shredder, which has uh, uh, small pieces which, which uh, pop out, uh, is a must-have, and a lot of uh, don't have it. So this is uh, a good potential attack um, or a, a good potential problem to attack them with a dumpster diving. So attackers can easily uh, figure out uh, what was the data which was uh, shredded and reconstructed. And if it's uh, one of the lists of the, of the uh, credit cards, you have a problem with that. That's the reason if, if you check out, uh, you, you get a, um, a receipt for every transaction you do at a point of sale. Some of them are already masked with only the last four numbers or six numbers and some X's and the last four numbers or with stars. Um, this has changed because a lot of people buy something, take this receipt and throw it into, into the trash. And uh, a lot of people found out that it is uh, very efficient to clean this trash before the cleaning guys arrive. And uh, that's the reason why this is uh, currently changed. A lot of uh, companies have already this uh, masked uh, receipts for the customer, but some even uh, today use uh, the full number, so don't throw it away, cross-cut it yourself. If they don't uh, do the security for you, you must do it for yourself. Um, yeah, the racks. The racks are uh, sometimes also very interesting. If, if you check the data centers, you uh, see a lot of uh, interesting implementations. Um, this was a, a situation, the, the side walls of the rack, uh, it, uh, the, the rack itself and the data center, everything was secure. And uh, I said, okay, can I check it? Uh, front door was locked, back side was locked, and I saw at the side wall were some uh, plastic levers, you can put them down. And uh, I said, can I uh, try to? And they said, yes, of course. And, and the complete side wall was in my hand, and I had full access to all servers and uh, patch panels, I said. Uh, for what are you um, locking the doors if the side is open? Um, you have two sides, so you, you have uh, the front and back secure, but uh, both sides are open. That was an interesting exploit uh, to physically access uh, the servers because they never expected someone to open the rack from the side because it has two doors. Hmm. Um, Another one had uh, two different models of racks. And um, one was higher than the other. So one was like uh, until here, and one was like here. And here is one side which is not uh, protected. So you have to put a side wall on it to, to protect the access to the systems. But it was open, so I could get into it. And uh, in, in, in this difference, uh, there was a patch panel, so I said, uh, what about here? I mean, everything is locked, everything is secure, but I can, and I can access a complete uh, patch panel uh, without uh, doing some uh, really stressy uh, lock uh, opening. So they didn't remember or uh, uh, check if you have differences in, in the uh, high of, of the rack that you can, uh, of course, access it that way. At another data center, everything was fine. We went into the room where the racks are stored, and we saw everything was clean, correct, only one table, and uh, to, to sit there, everything uh, locked. So I went there to check if it's really locked. The side walls were closed. And when I turned around, the back side was open, and all the servers popped out. And I said, uh, what, what about this backside situation here? They said, yes, you know, uh, we bought the racks before and the servers later, and the servers are longer than the rack, so we can't close it. Uh, so from the front side, everything was OK. But when you go around, everything is open, and you can access the full systems. And uh, I mean, that was uh, not that good. Finally, because our time is uh, running out, I want to present you some statements which we heard when we interviewed them or tried to explain them their serious problems. One guy said, we need no policies or procedures, everything is inside my head. Uh, 
So it's an interesting implementation of living process of security. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, of course you need policies and procedures because uh, security is a living process. You have to uh, put some policies, procedures, uh, um, organizational and technical uh, um, measures to, to address the risk. But uh, that was a statement uh, from a CEO. The next one or is, is a generic one. They say, uh, we never faced an incident since uh, I don't know how many years and uh, we, we are secure so we don't uh, um, have a problem with the risk. And uh, that is exactly what this Captain Smith said. Uh, you have no clue if in the last uh, 20 years uh, nothing happened that in the next five minutes something would happen. But this is a, a generic answer you receive uh, many times from administrators, developers, uh, CEOs, whatever. Um, the next one is an interesting one. Uh, we don't deal with shoes, of course we are secure. Every time I remember that one, I realize uh, or think about Al Bundy. <laughs> Don't deal with shoes. <laughs> but uh, you've seen sometimes it's really so poor that it could be addressed to Al Bundy. Um, a statement is also uh, the system is running for more than I don't know how many years. We can touch this running system. The record uh, of, of this uh, uh, was a system, it, it was a host um, system, which w is uh, running currently for 23 years. It's amazing, but uh, they can't uh, turn it off. It's processing 24-7. They have uh, very few special maintenance modes, and uh, they tried to change the system uh, to, to a new uh, uh, version or type of, of infrastructure three times and uh, didn't made it. So they said, finally, it's too hard, we just let it go. Um, okay, when all COBOL programmers died, <laughs> I don't know what uh, they will do, but let's see. Um, an interesting statement if you come to the uh, business need to know to access full card numbers is uh, when, when you check uh, the account of a CEO, uh, you see that he has full access to full card numbers. And if you ask for the business purpose, the statement is, I'm the CEO and of course I need full access to cardholder data. It's mine. Uh, of course it's not him, uh, his, uh, it's the cardholder data from the cardholder scheme and uh, of course, it's our data because our name, for example, is on that uh, card. Um, but uh, CEOs uh, think that everything is uh, there, so of course they need the full number, even if they don't need it for their business. And uh, the last statement is, we are secure. This is, this is uh, very generic. Everyone says uh, that they are secure, but uh, when you conduct the audit and uh, show them their uh, gaps, uh, they find out that they are maybe not. So that was my lecture. I hope uh, you did enjoy it. And uh, if you have questions. <laughs> if you have questions, ask now. My voice is going. I have a question, actually. Um, like, a few years ago, uh, like we discovered that one of the companies who are processing this credit card data was using GET request. So, and they had a web trans live server where whole enterprise could access, where you just click and like see in the Apache web logs all the card holders' data. Yes. I know that the company never talked to Visa or Mastercard and like reported is. A, it is an incident. So my point is, uh, what happens when the company don't choose to report an incident, not to pay these like fees, some million euros, whatever? Um, this, this is an incident uh, in in the company, which is uh, storing, processing, transaction, uh, transacting uh, cardholder data. It's not an incident because this data was not fraudulent used. If it's fraudulent used, or if you have a uh, have a uh, 
clue that it was uh, stolen or compromised, then you have to report it. There's uh, no uh, um, hiding of, of this information possible because you must report this. Um, but uh, this is what, what we find uh, out at the audits has only to be checked and addressed for the next re-audit. So we give them uh, the, the minimum amount of time they need to implement this. Uh, and uh, finally, if they, if they change this, uh, for example, this get and, and post request to uh, no more cardholder data in, in this uh, uh, web server log files, then it's okay because they addressed it. Uh, one of the policies in requirement 12, and again, I would uh, refer you to, to the links uh, I provided. Uh, one of the requirements is that you have to uh, implement a security incident response management. And each uh, um, incident with, which happened inside the company and was not fraudulently misused outside, you can, you can uh, uh, address with, with your own policy and change. If there was uh, an insider attack that someone is stealing the data, of course you must report it. But this was no, no compromise, it was only a, an incident and if you address it uh, that way, it's, it's uh, no problem. Uh, yes, yes, but that's, that's the question. What happens if the company doesn't report it and somehow Visa or MasterCard discovers it? Are there some obligations re regarding that? Um, if if uh, Visa and MasterCard uh, see that he is not compliant to the standards, um, he, uh, there are the penalties. I mentioned that uh, Visa and MasterCard or the PCI Security Standards uh, uh, Council are um, regularing uh, in their programs, uh, for example, also the penalties. So they can, of course, uh, uh, put penalties on, on uh, these persons or get a new deadline to say until this date you must have implemented each requirement correctly and an auditor uh, will uh, independently uh, check this. Um, the other option is that they disconnect him. So this is also possible. And if you are disconnected from one of the card schemes, uh, normally you are out of the business because you must provide a service uh, one, uh, the full service from one hand. And if you can't provide, for example, Visa or MasterCard, you are out of the game. So this is how they can address this. Um, uh, one question. Yes. Uh, in the beginning of your presentation, there was a slide about example merchant with about three years worth of uh, credit card data and 20 million euro of damage. Yes. It looks like it was a slide for bankers, not for uh, House Computer Congress. It's a little bit over-exaggerated. Uh, the, fig the figure of fraud damage is exaggerated in this slide. Um, th the assumption here is that all the 10,000 uh, compromised cards are fraudulently used. Yes, then yes. You get the uh, assumption in this slide is that is somebody for three years steal it daily. You, you can store the, the no, cards it, for three years in your database if, if it's only 10,000 uh, uh, transactions, uh, you have 10,000 tracks in your database. Uh, yes, but they expire. Cards do expire and they this exaggerates ex your situation, well, several times. They so it is a sort of paranoia which you are selling for bankers, not here. And okay. that's a sort of complaint, uh, not a question. To, to address uh, your assumption, correct, is if, if you store the last three years, a, a card has an expiry date uh, normally for three years. Uh, let's assume only 10% only of this is compromised, 1,000 cards. You have again a fraud of 2 million euros. Yeah, 10 okay. times less. A, a small merchant uh, cannot uh, compensate that. It simply take, uh, will be disconnected uh, and out if, of the game. If uh, 10 times difference is about the same, uh, can I take 90% of your money from the pocket, from your pocket right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> um, another question about the standard. Um, from what I understand, um, PCI is only implemented by credit card companies. Yes. Um, are you aware of any similar standards for other card-based schemes like um, uh, ATM card uh, electronic cash payment schemes? Um, of course you have uh, standards for them which are defining how you have to secure this. Uh, the, the payment card industry data security standard is addressing uh, e-commerce transactions, point of sale transactions and mail order, phone order transactions with credit cards. 
So this is only addressed here. Uh, you have, for example, for the German debit card, uh, you have the ZKA uh, standards which are addressing uh, security features and uh, some other implementations, but uh, that's not uh, part of this uh, lecture. I guess um, the problem starts very earlier and your auditing is really nice, but um, we have seen <laughs> in your uh, lecture that um, the CEO comes and said so yeah but I need access to all the data and we all know our CEOs they have four PDAs five notebooks and they want um, all data on the notebooks on their PDAs and maybe on their sailing um, ships in the Adria and, and on their second um, flat somewhere and um, all IT managers and administrators have the problem that you have um, processes that um, that are functioning and they are secure. And yes. then your CA, CEO comes and says, oh no, that, mm, I need access, we can't do this. So. And that's the point where da führt sich das ab ad sodum and we all, also, um, IT managers, administrators should become um, a tool to kick out their CEOs to say, go out, go to your office, browse some porn, But let me do it, right, it's, it's and secure. It's addressed here. Uh, in, in the requirement 12, the, the in, uh, information security policy, there is a requirement that the um, management has to sign this statement duly. So uh, they must uh, sign the statement that this, that this information has to be protected in a data security standard compliant way. So if something happens, the management can't say, oh, we had no clue that this happened. I mean, uh, if he signs that the company will protect the, the uh, data with this standard and uh, the CEO is, for example, the one who, who signed it and uh, is storing the data in an unsecure way, um, the problem will be him and not the administrator. So this is uh, addressing already this problem. Thanks. Um, how do I do single-click shopping without storing the CCV2? That is recurrent uh, transactions. Um, you can do uh, something like uh, abos and, and recurrent uh, transactions. Um, you have to, at, at the first time you have to send the CVV because it's in, in uh, mail order, phone order transaction. And at the next times they send only uh, the uh, different uh, data without the CVV too. And the acquirer uh, gives an approval because he says, okay, the flag for recurrent transaction is set. It's uh, still in the time frame which we defined as uh, correct and uh, he can do the shopping. But uh, the problem is um, not so much your one because you can of course deny this transaction and get the money back if, if there is uh, fraudulent use. So, I mean credit card transactions are really nice because you can give them back. So, But the time frame is unlimited in that case. But that's legal then. No, no, we can get into details later. I can, I can uh, show you the standard uh, which is defining this. Okay, thanks. It's a secure way. Hello. Uh, these pen tests are periodic. Please? So these penetration testing, it's periodic. And to companies that are already PC 1.1 compliant. Um, so how can they have be PC 1.1 compliant? And still be running stuff like uh, Red Hat 6 or SUSE 7.0. Um, most most of these uh, security gaps have been uh, popped up at the workshops to prepare an audit or discuss about uh, uh, the offer, or um, when the first audit happened. Um, when when the first audit was conducted, we have a, a checklist of what is compliant and what is not. And what is not compliant, you have to address with an action plan. You have to target each requirement to say, okay, we are not compliant to this one. We have to uh, spend so many hours on it, so we need uh, three weeks to fix it. 
and after three weeks this requirement will be compliant. The auditor will recheck this with a re-audit and uh, if finally each, com each requirement is checked, uh, they get the compliance status if, if they have the mix of uh, security scan and audit compliant. The audit has to be done annually uh, and the scan, depending on the level of classification, must be done quarterly or year, uh, also annually. So uh, most of the problems have been before or at the first audit. And how many re-audits can they fail before they are kicked out of PC standard? Uh, it's, it's, Never happens. it's not a kick out. I mean, you are compliant to standard or not. If you're not compliant, you are fully responsible for the fraud that happens. If you are compliant to the standard, you can gain a wafer and say, okay, we have been compliant to the standard, we did really our job in a serious way, but still some zero exploit, I don't know, whatever uh, uh, can happen, uh, happened, and uh, they say, okay, you, you forced us to implement the standard and put a lot of money into the security. The bef benefit, of course, is that the uh, card schemes say, okay, this fraud happened, but you did your job very well, so uh, we take the costs, you get the wafer. But uh, this depends on the decision of, of the card scheme. It's, it's uh, uh, the, the natural interest of a, of a uh, processing company to, to get this uh, standard. And the card schemes are making pressure to get everyone compliant. So you have no choice on the long run. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, then uh, again, thank you. And, uh,